Kia ora and welcome to Muffin Talk. Muffin Talk is a weekly radio program to which I invite guests to talk about their work and their passion for issues on social justice, Bible studies, interfaith relations, or community programs. Today, I've invited Debbie Miller to a Zoom recording for broadcast. Debbie, a warm welcome at Haida Maito Radio Program. Shalom. Debbie Miller is an active member of Beth Shalom, the progressive Jewish synagogue in Auckland. She is a lifetime student of Jewish studies, and we've been doing a series on interviews with her, and uh, today we are coming to the topic of women. With Brother Karen Fenn in August, we're going to have a session on the women in the Bible, um, but these are, we're going to talk about the women as they are depicted in the Bible, the particular women, but with Debbie, I'd like to talk about women in general. Um, women in the Bible, they are often left out of the Bible, or in some translations, you women are mentioned, and in some other translations, when you have the we or so, it's not, they are not particularly, they don't get the place they deserve. What do you think? Ah, this is one of, we had a long discussion about this, actually. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I would say that women are marginalized in the story um, narrative in the Bible. And I think with good reason. And then we were having this discussion between the two of us. And I made the argument that based on culture and history um, of the times, if you look at it, there's a clear reason why women are marginalized in the Bible. And, um, and then if they are there, it's in spite of the fact that culturally and um in historical context would leave them out so you need to understand that when they are there they couldn't get away with not mentioning them because you wouldn't be able to understand the story without them in it but in general they weren't meant to be there because the way the bible if you unpack it is talking about things is very tribal. So in other words, um, Abraham represents a man, but he represents much more than a man. He was a community of people who were connected to his family. It was him, his wife, his kids, um, his father, his um, all of his servants, and the people who thought well, what he was saying was cool and they all moved as an enclave people didn't travel by themselves in the desert in the time it was very unsafe to do that so whenever you see individuals they're actually representative of a group so abraham was a tribe and and his sons were each time a tribe. And all of Jacob's sons were tribes. And tribes were never named after a woman. They were named after men. It was a patriarchal society. So if you're going to refer, refer to the tribe of Abraham or the tribe of Isaac or the tribe of Jacob or the tribe of Lot or whatever else, you aren't going to say the tribe of Abraham and Sarah. That wasn't the way it was discussed. It was discussed as the tribe of Abraham. And they don't say the tribe of because there was no necessity to do that. It was like it was implicit. It was understood. So and, and also it's just when, when you talk about the tribes and you have uh, people like Naomi and uh, Ruth. Ruth and Ruth is following Naomi. And that was a different tribe. So she would be under the protection of, of uh, Naomi's tribe. Is that correct? Well, so then again, then when I say it's really important to understand that when you get a woman's story, it's because they had to tell it. It didn't make sense otherwise. Okay. So the you have to look at why at the very end of the story you get understanding why they told the story they say and ruth begot ovid and ovid begot jesse and jesse begot david and david became the king of israel and david is supposed to be 
the one who returns all the people of Israel back to to the land or what you more commonly would call the Messiah, the deliverer, is what we, Mashiach, the one who brings them back. So that's why they had to tell the story because Ruth, this Moabitist who was not Jewish, becomes the great grandmother of the guy who's going to facilitate the famous line of David, who's going to bring the Mashiach. So it had to be told. They couldn't, they couldn't get around explaining who Ruth was without telling her story. Cause, and she was essential because she was the great grandmother of David. So whenever you find a woman's story, look for the reason why they had to tell it they couldn't get away with not telling it it was too problematic to have a moabitist who was from the tribe of moab who wasn't part of the jewish people be the the great grandmother of the mashiach the deliverer the the messiah as you would call it do you so, know any example of a man who is in the bible without any purpose Well, it's not like that because men are always part of the narrative. So it doesn't exist, that whole mental exercise. You know what I mean? Like Aaron. Aaron is the the forefather of the Kohanim, the priestly class. So whenever you see the story of Aaron being very strongly brought forward, you know that the priestly class, which were really the transcribers of the Torah, they had an intention of making him and Moses strong and Miriam very weak. And you practically lose Miriam in the story. They only mention her as an aside, they can't get away with not mentioning her because she led the woman in dance. She found the water at every well. She, um, the whole community, when she got buried, the only time they talk about the whole community stopping was with Miriam's burial. And then you understand the whole community stopped in the desert because they were mourning Miriam's death. Well, then you say, whoa, nobody else gets talked about that way. Who was she? What was she really? Because she was obviously this incredibly central and powerful leader from a spiritual point of view. Like she found water and water is, a, is also a like metaphor for spirituality also. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that, but yeah. it definitely has that meaning. And so, um, and for life, and so in the desert, it's central. And so Miriam was this amazing leader. And we only know she was an amazing leader because the whole community stops. And nobody else do. They don't stop for Aaron. They don't stop for Moses. They don't stop for any other leader. Miriam, they stop and mourn. So we know that she was central. She was but, spiritual and practical. Yeah, exactly. And so you have to what you have to sort of like unpack every time there's a woman, you have to unpack why is she mentioned in spite of everything because they couldn't get away with it. So what's the what's the signpost? What's the reason we have to talk about Ruth and Naomi? What's the reason we have to understand how central Miriam was? You know, why do we have to talk about Sarah? Why do we have to talk about Rivka and her manipulation of, of getting, um, and she also, it was of Rebecca, all the women, right? Rebecca. Re, right, sorry, Rebecca, I keep doing <laughs> yeah. that, sorry, I call them by their Hebrew name. So Rebecca, remember how I told you, I mean, if you've all been listening to all these stuff, and we talked about the Hineni moment, the moment where you say, I am here, okay? Yes. And so in the story of, of Abraham, he says to God, he nanny, I am here. I'll do what you will. Rebecca says the same thing. She says, he nanny. When, when um, Eliezer comes to pick her out on behalf of Isaac as his wife, she says, he nanny. 
Mm. And I am here. I am willing. I see my role as central. And I'm saying Hineni is a moment with God. It's there. It's said as if it's I'm willing to go and become Isaac's Isaac's wife. But in if you look in the context, she's saying Hineni to God, just the same as Abraham said Hineni. And the Hineni monument is I am here. And so that is a sign as to how central this woman is to the decision-making process of who the next forefather or leader of the Jewish people is going to be. She is the decider, and that's why her story is included, and that's why her nanny moment is included, because she decides Jacob versus Esau. She's the one, not Isaac. It's not based on, on the hereditary norm. And so... When you see these women take on roles or say powerful phrases, then you know, ah, signpost, this woman did something really exceptional. They couldn't get away with not including her. <laughs> but but it also shows uh, with that, what you mentioned with the Hineni, um, it also shows that with the Hineni moments that you described, that it didn't matter to God if it was a woman or a man who talked to him. I think they... Um they couldn't understand uh, anything but a traditional format. Um, and that's why they wrote the way they did. I think the people who wrote it down couldn't see it any other way. But does God see it that way? Absolutely not. That's why God chooses who God chooses. And, and mm -hmm. Rebecca's a Hineni person. And um, and Ruth the Moabitess becomes a Jew and, and is the forefather of the Messiah when normally we think of people who are going to be the future of the Jewish people not to be strangers, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we had the discussion. <laughs> the future of the Jewish people is this woman who's from Moab, right? That doesn't make sense. So it, it goes against the normative standard. But obviously, God doesn't view things that way and so god chooses who god chooses not it's not chosen based on on our prejudices that's a really interesting point and uh, so rebecca i i like your way of ex uh, explaining about rebecca um but then there are also some women in the bible that um we christians uh, um have a different point than the Jewish people or we have we have some some women um like let's say Esther where you have this story about Esther and um I don't know is it part of the Bible yes the Hebrew Bible yep yep and it's not it? part of the Torah the first five books it's part of the later ones but it, it's the Tanakh which is the Torah and writings and yeah and prophets it's part of them so why do you think it was Esther? She was writ was written down a whole book of Esther. It's it's a story that actually um, speaks really strongly to Jews who live as a minority in a non Jewish land, hmm. and um, and oppression and trying to live as a second class citizen and hide your identity there's so many so many stories in esther that talk to the jews who are dispersed throughout the world i i think they couldn't get away with not putting the story in there <laughs> and honestly in the book of esther it's the one book in the whole tanakh the Torah, Nevi'im, which is prophets, and Ketuvim writings, it's the one book that doesn't mention God. God's not mentioned in the book of Esther. And mm. that it's, it's a story it's, about living as a Jew in a non-Jewish world and being in a situation where you cover up your identity. I mean, Jews today in New Zealand, and I walk down the street, nobody would know that I'm a Jew. There's no identifying thing. You know, am I am I hiding it? 
I don't think so, but I've come to live in this culture and I look like everybody else. Yeah, and, and so and so I am an Esther in essence, unless I choose to alert the entire world that I'm Jewish, which I do on a regular basis, but in cho unless I choose to blah, 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 that I'm Jewish, nobody would know. It's interesting that you mentioned again, you choose or you chose and Rebecca chose. The, so it seems like the women who are appearing in the Bible, they are very active. They choose. They are not chosen by somebody else, but they are the ones. And uh, and even with Esther being hesitant when her uncle says, what if you are the one who are chosen? So she still had a choice. And she yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the outstanding qualities about the Torah is that it says you have a choice. You make choices. That is what it is to be human. Two things I believe are to be human that one is that we should be creative like god god is creative created the earth and what makes us human is being creative however you so choose and the other one is that we have the ability to be human is to make choices animals are driven by their innate sense but we can make cognitive frontal cortex decisions that's what it is to be human And we can make choice to do right, to follow the rules, or to do wrong. And that's that's what it is to be human. And so, and it's interesting. I like that you highlight that these women have made choices. Um, but I actually think all the characters in the Bible um, are all attributed to making choices. They're all... Um, Except for Jonah. For good and bad, making good choices sometimes, making bad choices sometimes. But they, these are people who are proactive. The, and, and, and like I said, with regards to them not being included or to being included, the reason women aren't there is because they were just part, like Jacob. I love this story. Jacob has 12 sons. How many daughters does he have? One, Dina. Okay, one. However, when they move, when the tribe moves, it says he took all his. Well, you only know of Dina because she, the rape of Dina, right? Yeah. When they move, they say he moved down to Egypt with his banim vabanot, with his sons and daughters, S. So that means. And we also know, usually in birth, that um, there's about 50% chance, 51% chance that the girls will survive. So we know that if he had 12 sons, he at least had 12 daughters, not more. Okay, But we don't know about them because he, it, there was no need to mention them except for Dina because she was raped and they did this whole story of, that they had to deal with. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the reality. We weren't doing anything outside the norm. It's like saying, what did you eat for breakfast? Well, we, everybody eats breakfast. So then for, we know that you ate breakfast. We don't have to mention breakfast. It's not, it's not a question, but back in the time of Jacob, people only ate probably one meal a day. So people didn't, You didn't have to say what did you eat for breakfast or lunch or dinner because there was one meal in the day and that was it, you know, and you that was what you ate. It, it's all a question of why do you need to mention it? If there were women there and we're covering women when we say the tribe of Jacob or we say the tribe of of uh, of of Isaac or A or Abraham. You don't need to mention it. It's a given that there were 50% women there, you know, and, and, there, mentioned... and there were, and there were a hundred children. It's a given, you know, why are they not <laughs> mentioning all the children? Why would they mention the women or the slaves or any of the other people that were tagging along? They were all included in Jacob. That was it, Jacob. And that meant women, slaves, children, you know, the whole rigmarole. The household, uh, Jacob and his household. 
Right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and so it's very much a question of um, were women doing something different than all the men were doing? Yeah. And they weren't. I mean, women were shepherds and women were weaving and women were cooking and women were farming. They were doing all the jobs. One of the funny things, if you look at culture, you know, early agricultural culture, women and men's jobs differentiated very little it's only with the industrial revolution and a certain economic status that women became staying at home with the children and men went out to the factory and there was this power dynamic and who made the money and who lived in the household back in the time when we first were becoming agricultural settlers which is what the time of Abraham is, um, women and men, jobs were not so sexually demarcated. Men and women both went out in the fields, men and women both shepherded, men and women both, um, maybe women, they obviously gave birth and were with the child, but those women in those days, they were pregnant. They went out and worked in the field. They did everything till the second they were actually given birth. A lot of the women gave birth in the fields and went back the following day and worked. I mean, it wasn't a big deal. You know, you just went with the baby strapped on your back. You mentioned the other day that uh, the community was not hunting. That was one of the points that, that Ita was, was hunting. And I think that was in the early days. That was usually the difference between men and women. But if you were... Uh, because the men were hunting and the, the women were doing agricultural work. No. So I'm real big student of evolution. And the reality is that most hunter gatherer societies, they say, a lot of research says that probably 60 to 70 percent of the diet with the exception of Neanderthals who lived in like glacial times where there was only meat available, okay? They were primarily gatherers. People had primarily a vegetarian diet. And um, and so that was, um, yeah, the hunting, we, we like that machoism culture of hunting, but the reality is that 70% of their diet was actually based on gathering, not on hunting. Hunting, maybe massive game that did exist at a certain time during the Neanderthal period where it was glaciated, but when there was grasslands and trees and forest, people were gathering their food and that was their primary diet. And the, tea, the teeth show that. So I don't really buy into that. And one of the other defining, uh, here we go, evolution again, but one of the other defining um, qualities um, of human evolution is that there's very little um, stature difference between men and women from gender point of view, and that actually is indicative of the fact that the roles aren't very sexually defined. So the fact that women and men are very similar in stature compared to other more sexually divine, defined um, species shows that there we were actually um, were fairly equally divided in the way the the thing works. That that I got so off topic. I'm sorry, but I don't I don't buy into that one. That we were. I think throughout the ages we were pretty um, evenly divided. Um, it's just a cultural thing that that. Um, it was a normative way of talking about recording a narrative. And it wasn't history to them. They weren't recording facts. They were recording a story that spoke to something they needed to explain or a value they wanted to talk about or a ancestral line they wanted to identify with so that God would recognize them. So, so is it was, a lot of uh, this, the, the genealogy, this fucker papa, this is really... Yeah, important. absolutely. Because if it wasn't important, they could just mention directly uh, Jacob. Me, me. And didn't have to mention Esau at all. Right, and, exactly. And, 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 and it, wouldn't, wouldn't yeah, have Rebecca in it. 
Yeah, exactly. And so the, the reality is that, you know, we're just like the Maori culture where in order for the powerful on high to recognize us, we need to say what our, what do you call it? The fuck a papa is, <laughs> but what my aunts, my forefathers, I have to say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have to say that because otherwise you won't know where I came from. I remember, um, the late, uh, Steve Daniels, may his memory be a blessing. Mm -hmm. Um, he taught a course on the similarities of, the maori he was culture he was Jewish in, and maori yeah and it was really really interesting how he brought that out and i was like wow but it was it was clear that you know when we're saying abraham isaac and jacob we aren't talking about men we're talking about my ancestors and that's the way they talked about ancestors it had nothing to do with a gender and it's it's interesting because also the remnant is also the last names often. That the last names are often the son of and the man's name or the daughter right, of right, so exactly. and so. Thank you so much, Debbie. I think that was really interesting about the women in the Bible and uh, the women's names or the women who you couldn't get around not mentioning it if you <laughs> want to do genealogy. And there are roles that the women play. And uh, thank you very much for this. So for more information and any current or past programs, please check out www.studyjoy.nz. Thank you so much, Debbie, for this series of four sessions on the Bible and on context within the Bible. Thank you, and I uh, hope to see you for another interview sometime. That was fun. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>